Hi, I'm Roger Larson, an orthopedic surgeon at the University of Washington Sports Medicine Clinic, and what I'd like to talk about today are injuries to the anterior cruciate ligament. And I'm going to be helped today by four patients who have uh, experienced this injury, and as we go along, we'll, we'll talk to them also about how this has affected them. I'd like to start by first pointing out some basic anatomy of the knee joint. And this is a, a right knee, and I'm going to move the kneecap out of the way so we can see some of the anatomy deeper within the knee joint. And to get quite basic, the bones that come together to form the knee joint are the femur bone above and the tibia below. And four ligaments hold these bones in alignment, and that's what's represented by these brown structures. And by definition, a ligament is a structure that hooks two bones together, and it's, uh, they serve as check reins to prevent abnormal motion. The two on the outside of the knee joint are called collateral ligaments, and they're positioned to keep the bones from moving side to side like so. The cruciate ligaments are near the center of the knee joint and they res are responsible for, for presenting, preventing anterior and posterior translation of the lower bone or the tibia. And by virtue of the attachment points, the posterior cruciate is positioned to prevent the lower bone from displacing posteriorly. The anterior cruciate, which is the one in the front, is positioned to keep the lower bone from translating anteriorly or pivoting out in this direction. Between the bones are the menisci, which are these structures, which are commonly called the cartilage. And the function of the menisci are to make these bones fit together more perfectly. In this plane, the end of the upper bone is a curved surface, while the lower bone is relatively flat. And the meniscus, by fit fitting between the bones, makes them fit together more perfectly. It's a wedge in cross-section and it fills in the gaps, making for a larger area of contact between the two bones. And the reason the menisci are made of cartilage, rather than just being the shape of the lower bone, is that they have a little bit of movement so that one can pivot a small amount and the menisci will move and accommodate that. One of the problems, however, in not having an anterior cruciate is if the lower bone starts to shift, then the menisci start to get loaded in ways they're not designed to take forces, and eventually they start to tear. If they get torn to the point where they need to be removed, then the two surfaces, the femur and the tibia, don't fit together perfectly anymore, and they start to wear the articular cartilage, which are the hard, slippery surfaces that cap the end of the bone. And the analogy we, we like to use is that these, this articular cartilage is like the tread on a tire, and as this starts to wear away, this is what we call arthritis. So the injuries to the anterior cruciate ligament is the most common significant knee ligament injury that we treat today. And it, the problem is that it often results in an unstable knee, which makes it difficult to continue with activities like high-level athletics or participation in sports on unpredictable surfaces. And there are approximately 50,000 ACL reconstructions annually in the United States. When we looked at this knee anatomy, we can also look at this arthroscopically. And I want to show just a few pictures of what this looks like in looking through an arthroscope. If we look directly into the anterior aspect of the joint, we can see the anterior cruciate ligament. This is the anterior cruciate ligament going from the tibia on the bottom to the femur up above. And the posterior cruciate ligament is here. We can also see the menisci. We're now seeing a lateral meniscus, this structure right here, with the femur bone up above and the tibia down below. And also a medial meniscus with the femur above, tibia below, and the meniscus in between. We're also seeing this nice, hard, slippery, smooth, white surface on the end of the bone, which is the articular cartilage, which is what we want to preserve. So the function of the anterior cruciate ligament is to restrain anterior tibial translation. So what it does is keeps the lower bone from slipping forward or pivoting out. And it is the primary restraint to that. And when the, when the anterior cruciate is injured, then that abnormal motion can occur. And people injure their anterior cruciate in a number of ways, but usually it's a sporting injury with, uh, that involves a twisting or a deceleration. And frequently the patient will either feel or hear a pop within their knee and then have a fairly significant pain. And it's unusual to be able to continue. This is not the kind of injury that you continue to ski the rest of the day and then get it looked at later. This is usually the last event of the day. 
And often there's a significant amount of swelling within the knee joint following this, which is blood that accumulates within the first 24 hours within the knee joint. And often the patient will experience a sensation that the bones have shifted. And when they present with this sort of a history, we know statistically that about 72% of the time they have a torn anterior cruciate ligament. And the way we examine for this is to do what we call a Logman test, but basically we use one hand to stabilize the femur and take the second lower hand and pull forward on the tibia in this direction and try to determine how much motion there, there is by doing that. And in so doing, we not only determine how far that bone moves, but also feel for an endpoint or tightening of the anterior cruciate ligament. And we can further investigate this with an MRI, and this is an example of an MRI of an intact anterior cruciate ligament, and here we see one that's torn off of its attachment to the femur up above. And another reason for obtaining an MRI in these knees is to look for associated injuries, and they occur fairly frequently. We know that the day someone tears their ACL, about 62% of the time they'll have some injury to a meniscus. And they will also have fractures to the ends of the bones or the osteochondral surfaces about 15% of the time. And other ligaments will be injured about 19%. And this is an example of a torn lateral meniscus. Again, we're seeing the inner rim of the meniscus and the tear right behind that. And we'll also frequently see bone bruises with these ACLs. And this is a fairly characteristic bone bruise that we see. We see a bruise on the end of the femur in this location and in the back of the tibia in this location. And that's because when the bones give way and shift, the lower bone shifts forward and actually impacts against the femur in this location. So what we need to determine now that we've established that the patient has an ACL tear is how do we proceed with the treatment of this. And right from the outset, the goal that we set is that the patient, we want to not have the patient experience repeat injuries to their knee joint because every time they have a repeat injury, they have the risk of suffering meniscal tears and osteochondral damage and premature arthritis. And in some patients, we can manage this non-operatively. But the key to managing this non-operatively is the patient's willingness to back off of their activity level and not do the, the dangerous high-level sporting activities. And so the, the various things that we consider in, in determining how to proceed with this are the age of the patient. Uh, this is becoming less of a factor than it was at one time. The, the laxity level, some patients when they tear this ligament are a lot more unstable than others and some are much more dependent upon their anterior cruciate than our other patients. And the activity level is probably the primary thing that will determine how we proceed or the desired activity level that the patient has. And then associated injuries will also have an Im impact on how we proceed, whether they have an osteochondral fracture or meniscal damage, for example. And as far as activity level goes, the consideration is really that the more the activity involves jumping, pivoting, or unpredictable surfaces, the more dangerous, dangerous it is to participate in without an anterior cruciate ligament. And the, the lower risk activities, which one could expect to do without an anterior cruciate ligament, are activities such as bicycling, swimming, going to the gym and working out with Nautilus equipment, rowing machines, stair climbers, elliptical trainers, Activities that are straight ahead on predictable surfaces are usually well tolerated without an ACL. And some of the intermediate risk activities are activities like tennis, golf, and intermediate skiing, where sometimes wearing a brace, a person can get back and do these activities. The activities that are very difficult, however, to get back to with an ACL insufficient knee are activities such as soccer, basketball, ultimate frisbee, football, volleyball, and high-level skiing. And so if the decision is then made that a person would be best treated with an anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction, then the, the things that we consider are what kind of a graft are we going to use to replace that? Because you can't go back and just hook this torn anterior cruciate back together. It's usually damaged to the point where we need to put something else inside of the knee joint to serve as the new restraint to that anterior tibial translation. Then we need to prepare the joint for that graft, create tunnels, to place the graft, then once the graft is put into the right position, we need to fix it to the bones and then undergo a rehabilitation program while the joint heals. And various things have been used to reconstruct the anterior cruciate ligament. The most popular two choices that people use as a substitute for the anterior cruciate ligament are first the patellar tendon graft, and 
the, the picture shows a, a, a graft taken out of the central third of the patellar tendon. And this makes a good graft, as we can see right here. It has a bone block on each end, which is very attractive. I think the downside of this graft, even though it's a very popular graft, is what we do here by taking a third of the patellar tendon in these bone blocks is a little more of an injury to the knee joint than I think is necessary to obtain a satisfactory graft. And my personal choice of, of graft to use in most situations are two of the hamstring tendons, the semitendinosus and gracilis tendons, which are two tendons the patient can function very well without, and they produce grafts like this which can be combined to make a four-stranded strong graft. There are some situations where we don't want to use any of the patient's tissues at all, sometimes because of age considerations or because of multiple ligament injuries or because it's been previously done and these grafts have been used. And in these cases, we'll use an allograft, which is a donor tissue. And this is an example of, a, of an Achilles tendon from a donor that can be fashioned into a, a very nice graft to use as an ACL replacement. And so now what I, what I want to do is, is lean upon our guests and talk a little bit about their injury and how they suffered this injury and then show some actual photographs of this, the surgery or a typical surgery to demonstrate this procedure. And so first I want to introduce Denise. And Denise, how did you injure your anterior cruciate ligament? By skiing. Having moved to the Pacific Northwest about 18 months ago and being very quite, quite athletic, I decided to take up a new sport of skiing. And with friends, drove up to Whistler within an hour of ski school. I had uh, fallen sideways um, at a very slow speed on relatively level ground in soft snow and felt a shifting in my knee. I, I had injured my left ACL and in fact had blown it a great number of years ago so I knew instantly that that instability was not good. So I um, ended my lesson, was able to walk off the hill and get to the gondola and back to my hotel and safely arrived back in Seattle to see you. And so, how long ago did you injure your, your opposite knee ACL? That was more, uh, well, a number of years ago. And, and how did you adjust <laughs> to not having that anterior cruciate ligament? I think I was just so young and at the time um, thought it was just a really bad sprain, but I think it probably took a good year for me to feel pretty confident into going back into the sports that I had participated in and then continued with my level of activity. So. Um, Although I always knew it was, had a little bit of instability, I gradually worked it back up to my ability of and walking And one thing around. we found is that sometimes a person who has good coordination and limits themselves a certain amount will be able to adapt to having one knee that is unstable. But it's very difficult to ad adjust to having a second knee that's unstable because you learn to depend a very, very much upon that stable knee. And so injuring the second knee is a lot more than twice as bad as injuring the first knee. And so the decision was made to proceed with surgery to reconstruct Denise's knee. And what I want to do is go through sort of the basic surgery that we would do to reconstruct an anterior cruciate ligament. And, and when the patient is brought to the